Right, uh, thanks. So, uh, although this is a typing session, uh, I thought I should say that no static checking will be described during this talk. It's entirely about dynamic analysis. Uh, and I thought so, uh, it's about a dynamic analysis for t catching uh, type errors as they occur at runtime in native code. And I thought I'd uh, start with a quote from some dynami dynamic uh, languages literature. So this is a nice definition that I like about what people normally mean when they say type safety. It's that uh, if we're dynamically type safe, it means that the behavior of any program, correct or not, can be understood in terms of the source level language semantics. Nice general statement. You might recognize it from the, this is a paper by Dave Unger and co-authors about the Klein metacircular self VM. Uh, so what's really nice about it is that it's talking about both correct and incorrect programs. In other words, I like to interpret it as saying that uh, type safety at runtime is really about debugging. Like we really want to, we, we want help for understanding when our programs have some bug in them. Um, clean error reports are better than corrupting errors. If we don't have dynamic type safety, it means that we're going to barrel past some error and we're going to corrupt the program state or we're going to fail at some much later time than the actual problem that, that we as a, de a debugging developer want to, to understand. So it'd be nice to have this property uh, even in unsafe languages like C. And that's what this talk is going to be about. Uh, so here's an example of what we, uh, what we want. Can I make this point of something? Yeah, OK. Uh, so uh, here's a bit of C code. It's from Git. So it's a real snippet of C code. And you can see that the program has got some tests where they say, OK, uh, we've got some pointer called obj. And it points to some object. And uh, I'm going to do some logic. OK, test, does this field equal this thing? Uh, and if it does, then I, I really believe at this point that this obj is pointing to an object of a certain type. So I'm going to cast that pointer. I'm going to do this cast to a struct commit. I think I've really got a pointer to a struct commit. But because this is C, of course, the compiler doesn't check anything. The runtime doesn't check anything. There's no checking at all. We're just going to proceed on the assumption that this is the case. Uh, so what we're going to do is describe a tool that is going to check this at runtime. If we're making a new pointer of a different type, we're going to check that it really is pointing at a thing of the type uh, that we, we claim it is. Uh, I'm going to add some side conditions. Uh, we want this to be binary compatible, so we're not going to change the representation of data at runtime. It's going to be good for using libraries, things like that. We don't have to recompile every single bit of code. Uh, we're going to keep it source compatible, so we really want existing C code to work. We don't want to have to add too much in, in the way of annotations, or we don't have to modify the style of our code. Uh, it should really work for idiomatic code, real C code that people write. Uh, and we want the performance to be reasonable, so we don't want it to slow down too much. We want it to be the kind of tool where you can leave it turned on during development, and maybe it slows you down a bit. But it doesn't slow you down so much that you, you get selective about when you use it. Um, so the system that I'm describing is called libcrunch, and it basically does this. Um, so here's what it looks like to use. Uh, you compile with this wrapper compiler, crunchcc, but really it's just going to call your underlying C compiler. It's going to do some stuff before and after compilation, um, including instrumentation, which I'll talk about. Uh, and then you get your program as normal. You can run it as normal. It just does exactly what you would normally see. It doesn't do any checks. Uh, it does absolutely nothing different. But you can run it with this special library loaded. And then it will do the checks for you. And what the check's going to do? Well, they might print you out a nice little warning message. And this is a bit dense, but basically it's saying that um, we were checking that some object at this address here was an instance of uh, UN32. But actually, it was pointing at some bit of the heap that was actually allocated as in32. And here's the place in the, in the program where you allocated it. So it, that seems like an error, so we're going to report that. Um, so this is kind of reminiscent if you've used a tool like Valgrind, or I should more properly say memcheck, which is the Valgrind tool that most people use most of the time. Uh, but it's checking completely different properties. So Valgrind actually doesn't know anything about the runtime types in your program, because it runs only on binaries. So this tool is really uh, it's actually going to deliberately not check things that existing tools check. It's not going to check spatial or temporal memory correctness. It's just going to assume that you've got some other way of checking those, like the existing tools. And it's going to check exactly those things that can benefit from runtime type information. So in this case, it's that we were casting a pointer from one type to another. So here's a sketch of how it works. Um, we Again, this is the same code I showed you a second ago. Uh, I put a big space in the middle, which I'll fill in in a second. So it's the same code. Uh, but just before the point where we do this cast, we're going to basically insert a side effect. Tandily C has this comma operator for us. So it's just saying to have, to have some side effect before you do this cast. And that effect is to do some kind of check. And the check is something to do with checking that this object pointer really is pointing at an instance of this data type. So this is just a sketch. So we're not really going to use strings to represent our types at runtime. Uh, and this check thing, well, you could, if you're being strict, you could make it like an assertion. So we abort the program if it's wrong. If we're just developing and we want to get, you know, 
component might want to let the program continue to see what else happens, so it might just be printing a warning and carrying on, which is actually what the implementation currently does. So we're going to do some check uh, before every pointer cast in the code. Uh, so to implement this, we need a runtime that can actually implement this is a function. Is a we're testing whether obj is a uh, instance of struct commit. Uh, we're going to see a couple of other flavors of check, as well as is a. Um, it's going to work by efficiently tracking runtime type information for every allocation in your process. So this is you know everything you malloc, but also anything on the stack, any global variables. Could also be storage managed by custom uh, custom heap allocators that you have in your program. And we're going to attach type information can be verified at runtime, we're going to attach that information to every allocation in the program. Uh, so actually the, the bit of the runtime that uh, does that um, type information stuff was actually presented last year onwards, so you can read my onward paper, um, onward paper uh, last year about liballocs, but I'll just give you a quick recap of, of what, what it's providing for us. So here's a little example data type, uh, which is an ellipse. Uh, it's got a couple of double fields for the major and minor radii, and it's got a point structure uh, within it for the center of the ellipse, and that's also got some coordinates uh, x and y. So what we end up with at runtime is some type information for every distinct data type in this composition of types. So here we've got we've got one for double, and it's got some information. This is it here. It's saying that uh, double is, is eight bytes long, and it doesn't have any containment substructure. We've got this point thing. Sorry, that should say point. Uh, it's 16 bytes long, and it's got two sub-objects, and they're at offsets to 0 and 8. And we have this, these pointers in between these verified runtime types to express the relationships between them. So here we're saying, that, OK, at offset 0, if I got offset 0, this arc is pointing back at double. We're saying at offset 0, we have a double in a point, which we do. At offset 8, we have another double, and so on. For the ellipse, uh, at offset 0, we have a point, and so on. So we can trace the whole containment structure of the data type um, through these, this information at runtime. Uh, and like I said, there's a bunch of other things. So this is just showing you structure types and primitive types, but actually we've got stack frames, functions, pointers, arrays, and so on. And uh, because we go to some pains to keep this information unique, it means that we can do a primitive test, which is saying, am I looking at type, type for int just by doing a pointer comparison? So if the, if the runtime tells me you have an int, it's uh, simple to test. I just check whether uh, does that pointer equal uh, <laughs> pointer to int. So we're going to do a short search, implement this is a we're going to short search over this structure. So let's say the runtime tells me that I'm at offset um, zero. Uh, you have allocated an ellipse on the heap, let's say, uh, and I want to know whether I can cast that to a double. So at offset zero of that, we're going to say, okay, do we have a double? Well, we follow this edge because we're looking at offset zero, and we find that we have a point. And we, we, okay, that's not a double. So can we recurse down another level, which we do, and we find that we have a double. So the check is going to pass because we found that at that offset, we do indeed have an instance of that data type. So that's the basic idea. Um, so this point, you might say, oh, well, this sounds very nice. It's kind of like Java, like, you know, we've got a class cast exception sort of thing. We can cast, we do a sort of check cast like in Java. But, you know, this is C you're talking about. So is it really that simple? Don't C programmers do lots of weird and wonderful things? Well, yes, they do. Um, there's lots of detail about all this stuff in the paper. Um, see if you can find your favorite thing on this list. I'm not going to go through it. Um, but I'm just going to talk about a couple uh, right now. Um, the ones I'm going to talk about are how we deal with malloc in the first place. You know, malloc is an untyped primitive, so how do you figure out what you're mallocing? It's not obvious. And the other is to do with multiple indirection, which is a thing you clearly don't have in Java in the same way as in C, pointers to pointers. So on we go. Um, to deal with malloc, we actually exploit the fact that I showed you we have a compiler wrapper, so you invoke this crunch CT. So we can do some source level analysis if we want to, and that's what we do here. So uh, when you're calling malloc or some other allocation function, uh, to in order to know how much to malloc, you're pretty much always going to use size of somewhere in your code. You're going to do a size of some data type, and you can multiply it by something else. Maybe I want an array of n uh, foos or whatever, then you're going to multiply the size of foo by n. So we're going to do a, a, an analysis at the source level to say, um, OK, uh, whenever we generate a size using size of, then we record that, OK, that value, this expression here, is labeled with a certain size of It's like a just a property to say that expression is has a foo size of It is recording the size of some number of foo. And then we can propagate it through your code. So maybe you do some arithmetic to multiply that up by some number. And eventually, the value flows into the argument of an allocation function. So you do this propagation like dimensional analysis, because sometimes you multiply size and then divide them again, and then you <coughs> add two sizes together. So we, we basically do an intra-procedural intra -procedural analysis to check, uh, to, to propagate this size of this to the actual what flows into the allocation function. 
And the most complicated things you end up dealing with are things like this, where what you're allocating is a single chunk of memory that's actually going to hold some of one thing and then some of another. So here we've got a, we're going to hold a, a chunk, we've got a malloc chunk that we're going to use to store a blah, and then some array of n foods. So what we're doing is effectively synthesizing a new structure type here that starts with a blah and continues with n foods. Um, we will give up in some awkward cases. Like if you decide to write your code like this, but then store things the other way around, so like you actually put the foods first and just add it, it's commutative, so you could add these things up any way you like. Well, I'm just gonna throw my hands up and say, you should probably fix that code, because uh, it's pretty confusing. Uh, but for the most part, this analysis works really well. It's very good at inferring what you're actually allocating when you do a malloc. So uh, that's one problem solved. And then, I, so uh, the, the tool chain extensions that we have in, inside this compiler wrapper, there's lots of extra stuff that's happening in tool chain, and one of the things is gonna dump for every C file that you build, we're gonna dump a little text file to describe all the allocation types in that, in that file. And then eventually that's gonna get compiled down into a binary blob that we can load at runtime, which is the type information for the whole, um, the whole binary that you built. Okay, so that's one little obstacle overcome. Let's talk about another one. This is a real bit of code from one of the spec CPU 2006 benchmarks. Could be from lots of different code. And um, what it's doing is taking an array of pointers. So you pass it a pointer, to an array of void pointer, that's like pointer to pointer to void, and it's gonna sort them in some way. It just does some, it does some kind of copying in a temporary array, puts them in some order, um, but actually this code is generic. So it's not just for operating on generic, on pointers to void, it's actually for operating on pointers to whatever you like. So here, the, the code that uses it is actually allocating uh, an array of pointers to integer. Okay, so that, that's, we can use our size ofness analysis that we identify that that's what's being allocated and then sometime later we call this sort function um, and we do this cast to void star star. So, so by rights this should fail because actually um, an array of void pointers is not, you know, according to normal subtyping rules, it is not safe to treat that as uh, uh, an array of void pointers because the usual sort of covariant arrays thing in Java where it's not safe to store an arbitrary pointer into that. We really want to be able to assume that it's always holding pointers to integers. Um, and the solution to this uh, is very much like uh, in Java, actually. So we, we have a bit of a more relaxed style of check for when you want to cast something to a pointer to generic pointer. This is not generic pointers, they work just fine, the normal style. But pointers to generic pointers, we're gonna do a more relaxed check where, we, okay, we let you cast it, as long as you have the right level of indirection, uh, we let you cast it. And then when, when you write through such an L value in C terminology, you will write through, so you wanna update, you wanna store to that array, just like in Java where you can get an array store exception, we're gonna check those writes rather than checking the cast, we check the writes against the type of underlying object. So this is a wonderful thing because we have runtime type information, we can actually say, okay, well, we know that this really is supposed to hold integers, so we can check that you're writing a pointer to integer into it. Okay, so people wanna know how fast it is. Uh, I mentioned that it's, it's a bit faster than a Valgrind family tool, so these are the spec CPU 2006 uh, benchmark numbers. Um, this column is the slowdown of the, the percentage you see that normally it's pretty low. In fact, a lot of these are really kind of, you wouldn't even notice some of, most of these. Uh, GCC is kind of annoying, so this is a run of the GCC compiler. Uh, that's the slowest that I've seen. Um, it's a bit annoying, but it's not, it wouldn't necessarily make you automatically turn it off. Um, and then this right-hand column is, um, that's the slowdown you see when, when you don't load the library. So I mentioned that you can build your program as normal, and then you just don't load the library, so you don't want to do any checks. And in return for not getting any checks, you get a very minimal slowdown. Sometimes it actually just because of random kind of memory placement kind of effects, uh, you end up running a tiny bit faster, uh, at least when I ran these experiments. But generally the slowdown you see is negligible. Uh, this number GCC is about 14%. I managed to get a number after I collected this data. Um, you might wonder, why did I not give a figure for Perl Bench? Does anyone here, uh, has anyone ever hacked on the Perl interpreter? No? Good, that's good for your health. Uh, so, uh, Perl has some of the nasty C code around and uh, it does manage to break some of the assumptions of the tool. For example, it will use size of a completely unrelated data type to size some heap allocation and use it for something completely different. So I can't really deal with that. There is a bit in the paper about all the things you need to fix to make Perl work and it's nothing magical. It's just grinding away at allowing certain special cases and finding ways of letting the programmer signal that that's all you need to do. So there's no magic, but I just haven't, haven't had the patience to make that, um, make that work yet. Uh, what's next? Oh yeah, so people wanna know, does it have any false positives or false negatives? So we really do instrument every point of cast. So in that sense, it's a sort of complete check. So we don't, we're, we're not risking missing things. We're not being kind of probabilistic or, or, um, or sort of best effort. We're really checking all this stuff. Um, 
So you might say, well, maybe there'll be some false positives. So this table is kind of summarizing uh, what false positives you get. Sometimes you do. So sometimes, for example, in BZIP2, uh, it will allocate an array as one type, and then it will, a bit later, decide, OK, now I'm going to use it as partly this type, partly some other type. So you store some differently sized integers into this end of the array. So that's something we can't deal with directly. So you get some warnings that you could argue are kind of unhelpful false positive warnings in that case. But most of these, actually, you don't get any, any problems at all. A few, I had to do some compile time fixes. These were just known bugs in the code that my uh, compiler front end happened to have a problem with, even though vanilla GCC would accept them. Um, the instances, so you actually get a, you could obviously imagine with a loop, you're going to run the same code a lot, and so you might get the same error repeated many times. By default, we suppress repeated errors. So you only see the warning once when that, that particular failing cast is hit, and then after that, it doesn't get repeated. Um, so this is sort of the unique count here. Uh, and again, most of, the, most of them zero or pretty low. Um, I'll tell you what I mean by a helpful false positive in a second. Right? So um, some of these false positives are kind of unhelpful because the code is definitely correct. It's legal according to the C standard, whatever. So you probably shouldn't be saying anything. Some of them, so the, the, the really nice thing is that this tool is really good at flagging up. Even if you run it on correct code, it will flag up all the dodgy things you did with pointers. Uh, and here's a, an example of, um, of that. This is, again, a real bit of code from one of the spec benchmarks. It allocates a huge array of double, okay? Allocates a big array. Uh, and mostly it will use it as double, right? So it's doing some kind of numerical stuff with it, sort of reads and writes doubles into the array. But uh, for some bizarre reason, uh, the program has decided that um, every 20th double in the array was actually not going to be a double at all. It's going to be an array of bit flags. So at some point in their loop, they, they use this magic cast macro and they cast it to a, an unsigned integer type and then they access it at that type. So my tool, quite rightly, Complains of that, even though if you go to the C standard, you look in the letter, or it says, well, you're allowed to, you're allowed to do a write which changes the effective type of an object that doesn't have a declared type. Uh, whether the people who wrote this code were thinking about that, I don't know, but uh, I'm quite happy that we flagged this stuff up. Um, so that's what I mean by helpful false positive. It's sort of technically you could argue the code is okay, but um, it'd be much better if you actually use some data abstraction here to to model the fact that you have bit flags as well as doubles. Um, Okay, so I've almost finished. I'm just going to say a little bit about, you know, if we can do this, if we've got runtime type information, even in C code, then, you know, can we build a really safe, completely safe implementation of C or something very like C, um, you know, much closer to real C than, say, Cyclone or CQR that's been done in the past? And I believe the answer is yes. Uh, there's a little shopping list here of things we have to add. I'm working on some of these already, not all of them, so if you're interested, uh, do contact me. Um, things like check, checking when you copy stuff around in memory, are you respecting the type of the destination? Do some kind of bounds checking. I think we can do better than the sort of state of the art stuff here. The same for temporal memory safety. We want to do some kind of garbage collection. Unions and var args, I have a kind of minimal approach in, in, the, in the current work, but I think we can do a lot more checking. Um, some stuff to do with initialization, um, writing to uh, 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 pointers to char and so on. So there's lots of stuff we can do with that. Please do ask me if you're curious. Uh, I'm just going to wrap up now. So uh, I'm claiming that checking pointer cast in, in unsafe code can be helpful and can be done efficiently. We can do it in ways that are source and binary compatible, low overhead, pretty convenient to use, and there's lots of cool extra stuff we can add to it. So thanks for listening. There's code on GitHub, and I'm happy to take questions.